Good afternoon. All right. So we're going to finish up um, probably the exam review today. Um, we'll get through again as much as we can. If we need to finish it up tomorrow, that's fine too. Um, but again, uh, I'll remind you, if you have specific questions that you really want more practice on, please let me know because um, that's what tomorrow can definitely be for is, you know, going through more examples of similar types of problems. Um, if there's particular ones that you really want to focus on. Okay, so just let me know if that's the case. Um, otherwise, you know, I'll just try to find some other random questions um, and we'll, we'll work on those tomorrow just to give you some more practice. Okay, um, so that's the plan for the rest of this week. Um, again, the only thing left at this point for you guys is the final exam. If you haven't already signed up for a time, please use that link um, in the announcement section to make sure that you sign up for your time next week. Again, it won't take you more than a minute to do that. Just input your email address, select a day, select a time, and you're done. Um, if you do need to change that time for any reason, please just let me know. Just email me, um, and I can definitely go in and change that in my spreadsheet. Okay. Um, thank you. That's all. Um, oh, and also, if you're if you have any questions about you know what you need on the final exam to attain a certain grade, because um, I get that a lot at the end of the semester. You know, what do I need if I want to you know maintain a B or whatever? Um, just email me, right, and I can do those calculations pretty quickly for you um, and let you know what you would need to get on the final exam. Okay. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, and it's really at this point easy because all of your grades are in there. So everything that you have so far is 80% and then you'd only have 20% left, right? So you can kind of figure out, you know, if, if what you have now is 80% of your grade, um, there's another 20% to go. You can figure out what you would need on the final exam um, based off that. And that's why I said at this point with no more tests or homeworks left, um, it's easy for me. I can do that calculation pretty quickly. Okay. Any questions though before we get started today? All right, so we started example seven yesterday. We got through the first derivative, increasing, decreasing, mins and maxes. Um, so now we need to look for intervals of concavity and any inflection points. Okay, so what are we gonna have to do next? So if we're looking for intervals of concavity, what do we have to find now? F double prime, second derivative, good. So I'm gonna take that first derivative that we found right here. And so what rule are we gonna to have to use then to find our second derivative? Good. It's going to be a quotient rule again, right? So go to the next slide here. I'm looking for f double prime of x. So if we let the numerator be the f function, in this case that was negative x squared plus 2x. And then the g function is just going to be our denominator. In this case that was x to the fourth, right? All right, so now what's our F prime going to be for that one then? Good, negative 2x plus 2. And what's our G prime? 4x cubed. Good. So now we'll use our quotient rule. Again, always start with G. So we have X to the fourth times F prime, negative two X plus two minus, then we do our F, which is negative X squared plus two X times G prime, four X cubed, all over 
the g function squared. All right, so now let's distribute combine like terms. If I distribute up top here, that's going to give us negative 2x to the fifth plus 2x to the fourth. Down here now, when I distribute that in minus, that's going to give us a positive 4x to the fifth and then a negative 8x to the fourth. all over x to the eighth power. All right, so then if we combine like terms there, what's our numerator gonna be? Good, so 2x to the fifth minus 6x to the fourth all over x to the eighth. All right, now that we've got that, what are we going to have to do? Okay, good, so if we factor the numerator here, what can we factor out? Okay, we have a 2x to the fourth as a common factor. It's going to leave us with x minus 3. All right, so now that we've got it factored, now we can do what with it? Good, right? So you could cancel out the x to the fourth here if you wanted to first, right? So you could say, well, this just becomes two times x minus three over x to the fourth power. That's perfectly fine. Um, and then we're gonna set the factors equal to zero. Either way, you're gonna get the same values, right? Whether you cancel those out or not. Okay, so in this case, we have x to the fourth equals zero, which is gonna give us x equals zero, and x minus three equals zero which gives us x equals three. And again, if you had not canceled out first, right, you'd still have that two x to the fourth equals zero would still give you a zero for your number line. So it really doesn't matter. In this case though, by simplifying it first, when we substitute back in, it's gonna make that process a little bit easier. So it probably does make sense to cancel out the x to the fourth there. All right, so now we are gonna do our number line. We have two values here, zero and three. Second derivative. All right, so what value do you want to test first? All right, good, negative one works. And I'm gonna plug it in down here now. So I have two times negative one minus three over negative one to the fourth. Right, so if we do that now, negative one minus three is gonna give us what? negative right so we have a positive two we have a negative here and what about negative one to the fourth that's always positive because we're raising it to an even power good overall then that's going to give us what a negative good so we have a single negative that's an odd number so we have a negative there 
Right. What about between zero and three now? Okay, positive one's good. We'll do two times one minus three over one to the fourth. And again, two is definitely positive. One minus three is going to be what? It's going to be negative. And like you said, anything to the fourth power in the denominator should be positive. So overall, this one's going to be what? It's going to be negative again, right? So that one's negative. So then finally, we need something to the right of three. Four is good. So two times four minus three over four to the fourth. And again, denominator is definitely positive. Two is definitely positive. Four minus three is also positive. So overall, we know that's going to be a positive bound. So let's start with our intervals of concavity, right? So what do we know now? All right, good. Concave down wherever it's negative, concave up wherever it's positive. So when we write our concave down interval this time, we do have to split it at zero because remember back to the original function, zero is undefined. So this is going to go from negative infinity to zero and then from zero to three. Okay, so do not just write negative infinity to three. We have to stop at zero because it is undefined at zero. And then concave up then would just be the other piece from three to positive infinity. All right, now, do we have any points of inflection this time? Yeah, x equals 3, it goes from concave down to concave up. In terms of points of inflection, we're going to have one at x equals 3. And if we want to know the actual point, what are we going to have to do? Good. Plug it back into the original function. Right? So if we go back to the original function here, we need to find f of 3. So we've got 3 minus 1 over 3 squared if we do that. 3 minus 1 over 3 squared. 3 minus 1 is 2. 3 squared is 9. So our ordered pair for the point of inflection then would be 3, 2 ninths. Any questions on that now? All right, so yeah, definitely be prepared for a question like this, right, where I give you a function and I ask for all those pieces. So you have to find first and second derivatives, find increasing, decreasing, um, concave up, concave down, any mins or maxes, and any points of inflection. Right? Those are the things I would ask for there. All right, example eight. So we have a particle moving according to the given data. We want to find the position of the particle. So in this case, we're given acceleration equals three cosine t minus two sine of t, where s of zero is zero and v of zero is four. We want to find our position function, s of t. So what are we going to have to do first here? Okay, good. We need to take the antiderivative, right? Because if we take the antiderivative of acceleration, that should give us velocity. So 
find velocity first. What would our antiderivative for three cosine t minus two sine of t be? All right, good. So first term here is going to give us three sine of t, and then this becomes plus two cosine t. So just remember, um, antiderivative of cosine is just sine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, and so then we have minus a negative, which becomes that plus there. Now, what else do we have to remember here when we take that antiderivative? plus C, right? So we have to have that constant here, and that's where these other points to the right are going to come into play. So what can we do now? Good. Since we know something about our velocity function, we can actually put those values into our velocity function and find the value of that constant. I'm going to set this equal to 4. And I'm going to plug in zero for my t value. So I have three sine of zero plus two cosine of zero. And then we're going to solve that for c. So if we simplify this over here now, what's three times the sine of zero going to give us? So what is the sine of zero? Zero, right? So three times sine of zero, that just becomes zero. What about two times the cosine of zero? That's going to be two, right? Two times one, which gives us a two. So we end up with two plus C on this side now, which means our C value is going to be what? Good, C equals two. All right, so now that we know C, we know our velocity function is V of T equals three sine of T plus two cosine of T plus two. All right, now we're looking for position. So what are we gonna have to do now? How do we go from velocity to position? Good. Take the antiderivative of our velocity now, right? So S of T equals, and so if we take our antiderivative this time, what's that going to give us? All right, negative three cosine t, positive two sine t plus two t. And then I'm just going to use d instead of c since we've already used c for a variable before, um, but that will be it. Good. 
All right, now what can we do from there? Okay, good, we can solve for D now because we're given information about our position function. So I can set this equal to zero, plug in zero for T. Zero equals negative three cosine of zero plus two times the sine of zero plus two times zero plus D. Right, so what are we gonna get on the right-hand side if we simplify that now? Good, just negative three plus D, because we know that sine of zero is zero, two times zero also zero. So the only thing that's gonna give us a value is that negative three cosine of zero, negative three times one, that's our negative three. So what's our D value gonna be this time? Good, positive three. So then our final answer, we just have to write the entire function, S of T is negative three cosine t plus two sine of t plus two t plus three. Any questions on that one now? All right, so example nine, so there's multiple parts to this one, but all of them are just finding the derivative. Okay, so we wanna differentiate f of t, where t, um, f of t is tangent of one plus e to the two t. How are we gonna do this one? Okay, good, so we can do a U substitution if you want to, right? So that'll give us tangent of U because it is gonna be a chain rule. We'll let U be equal to one plus E to the two T. That's the case, what's our U prime gonna be here? Perfect, two e to the two t. Right, because remember, we'll take e to the two t. Again, that's gonna be another chain rule there because the derivative of the exponent's gonna give us two, so we get two e to the two t. Now we can come back over here and think about what's the derivative of tangent u? So if we take the derivative of tangent, what do we get? Good, secant squared. So we're gonna have secant squared of u times u prime because of our chain rule. Now we can substitute, so we get secant squared of one plus e to the two t times two e to the two t. And honestly, if you get to there, that's fine. If you want to move the 2e to the 2t to the front here, that's fine too. We get 2e to the 2t secant squared 1 plus e to the 2t. Any questions on finding that derivative? Just so you know, the examples for derivatives on the actual exam are gonna be fairly similar to these. 
the reason for that is I can get a lot of rules into one problem, right? So you know, in this case, I've got a trig problem with a chain rule, and it also involves an exponential. Right, so consider, right, that those are the types of problems I'm going to choose just so I can get a lot and test a lot, you know, in one problem there. All right, so let's take a look at this one now. So we've got y equals square root 1 plus x e to the negative 2x. And so if we want to find that derivative, what would you do first? All right, so let's get rid of the radical. So y equals 1 plus x e to the negative 2x. That'll be to the 1 half power now. And then what would you do? All right, we can write that as u to the 1 half. So that means our u value is 1 plus x e to the negative 2x. Okay, so if we want to find u prime this time, what are we going to have to do? It's a product rule, right, with the main rule for the e to the negative 2x. So we'll let f be the x. We'll let g be e to the negative 2x. That means f prime is 1. So what's g prime going to be this time? Good, so negative 2 e to the negative 2x be e to the negative 2x times the derivative of the exponent, which is just negative 2 this time. So now for our u prime, when we use our product rule, start with f, we'll have x times g prime, negative 2e to the negative 2x, plus g times f prime is just e to the negative 2x times 1. If you want to rearrange those terms before you even substitute in. This is negative 2x e to the negative 2x plus e to the negative 2x. Uh, or you could even factor out the e to the negative 2x there if you wanted to. Now, when we find our derivative here then, what's that going to give us in terms of u? So that's just the derivative of one half. Okay, good, right? So power rule here, just one half, u to the negative one half. Don't forget it's a chain rule, so we have to multiply by that u prime. Good. Now we can start substituting stuff back in here. We've got y prime equals one half, one plus x e to the negative two x to the negative one half times u prime negative 2x e to the negative 2x plus e to the negative 2x. Okay, so the only thing I would ask at that point that you do is try to combine this. We know the negative fraction, um, fractional exponent can move to the denominator. 2 is already in the denominator here. So if I rewrite this, I'm going to have negative 
x e to the negative 2x plus e to the negative 2x over 2 times 1 plus x e to the negative 2x to the 1 half power. And again, if you want to factor out the e to the negative 2x in the numerator, feel free. If you want to change the 1 half to a square root, feel free. But as long as you get at least to that point, um, then I'm okay with that answer there. And if you do factor out e to the negative 2x, technically you'd have a negative exponent. You could move that to the denominator there too. Okay, so just there's other things you could do with this one, but again, I, I'm not going to be terribly picky about how much you do because I'm really looking to see can you get that. Okay. Any questions on that one now? All right, and so last derivative, h of x equals natural log x plus the square root of x squared minus one. All right, so what's the first thing you would do here? Okay, so take the natural log of u, so rewrite this natural log of u. So that means that u equals x plus, and I'm going to go ahead and change this radical to x squared minus 1 to the 1 half power. All right, so if we find u prime this time, What's that going to give us? So I'm going to go ahead and do this. So we'll do it's, derivative of x is definitely 1, right? So we can get that. Down here, we're going to have to use a chain rule with a power rule. Bring down the 1 half. Good. Keep the x squared minus 1 in here. And then we just have to make sure, um, subtract 1 from the exponent, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is just 2x this time. You want to do a separate u substitution, right? For that piece, feel free. Um, but that one's one I think. You know, the derivative of the inside is, you know, basic enough um, that you might be able to do it without it. So then we've got prime equals one plus. When I multiply this now, one half times two cancels out, so we're just left with x times x squared minus one to the negative one half. That's right. Good. Yeah. So the one half times two x just gives us x. Okay. All right. Now I know my u prime. Now we can come find the derivative. What's the derivative of h of x going to be just in terms of u here? Okay, good. So natural law gives us 1 over u. And we multiply by our derivative there. So substituting back in, we're going to get 1 over x plus x squared minus 1 to the 1 half times 1 plus 
x times x squared minus 1 to the negative 1 half. Now, if we actually multiply that, right, then all that stuff there on the right is just going to go into the numerator, and then we can't leave a negative exponent, so we have to think about how we're going to get rid of that. So we have 1 plus x times x squared minus 1 to the negative 1 half over x plus x squared minus 1 to the 1 half. Okay, so what can we do now to get rid of that negative exponent that we have in the numerator? So the problem is we can't just move it to the denominator because we have addition up top, right? So we've got to multiply by something with a positive exponent to cancel it out, right? So I'm going to multiply top and bottom here by x squared minus 1 to the positive 1 half. If I do that, that's going to give us, you know, a 0 for that exponent there, and we'll be able to cancel out that negative exponent. Now, just make sure you distribute when you do this. That's going to go to every term in the numerator. So we have x squared minus 1 to the 1 half times 1. It's going to be x squared minus 1 to the 1 half plus, and then when I multiply x, x squared minus 1 to the negative 1 half times that, what are we going to be left with? Just x, right? Because the other pieces are going to, again, become 1, so that just gives us x. Down here, same thing, distribute, so we're going to have x times x squared minus 1 to the 1 half plus, and then if I multiply x squared minus 1 to the 1 half times x squared minus 1 to the 1 half, what's that going to give us? Got just x squared minus 1, because that would be to the first power once we add the 1 half and the 1 half there. All right. And I'm good, right? At that point, once you've eliminated the negative exponent, I'm okay with that answer there. Again, majority of the points, though, if you can get to this point, I'm happy, uh, because at that point, I, under I know that you understand how to find the derivative of a natural log, how to apply a chain rule there to change the square root to a fractional exponent. Um, so all those little pieces, right, that's really what I'm giving you the points for there. Any questions on that one? All right, so number 10, okay, and again, there's multiple parts to this one, but they're all integrals this time. So we want to evaluate this integral here. So integral from 1 to 4, 2 plus x squared over the square root of x dx. All right, so if you saw a problem like this, what's the first thing you would do? All right, so we could try a u substitution, right, um, and say that in this case, you know, put a u, well, put a u inside the square root, though. You could let u equal square root of x if you wanted to and say u equals x to the one-half power. 
If we take the derivative of that though, is that going to give us anything that's helpful in the numerator now? It's not, because that's gonna give us a one half, x to the negative one half is our derivative, not gonna give us an x squared, right? Okay, so letting u be equal to that, not very useful in this case. Is there anything else we could do? Exactly, right? I only have a single term in the denominator. I can split this up and simplify it and then see if we can just find the antiderivative from there. So first thing, think of that as x to the one half power, right? So I'm gonna rewrite it that way. So we have two plus x squared over x to the one half dx. And so now if I split this up, I can just divide two by x to the one half, divide x squared by x to the one half. So what's that gonna give us now? So when I do this now, two divided by x to the one half, it's gonna be two x to the negative one half. X squared divided by x to the one half, remember we subtract our exponents there, that's just gonna give us x to the three halves. We have our dx. Now, if I wanna find the antiderivative for each of those terms, what would my antiderivative look like for 2x to the negative one half? Right, so we're gonna have, good. So keep the two, raise your exponent by one. So that's gonna give us x to the one half. But then we have to remember to divide by the new exponent. So that's over one half now. All right, what about the x to the three halves? Good, all right, so again, it's gonna be x to the five halves. We're gonna divide that by five halves. So yes, that would give us two fifths, right? Once we divide and multiply by the reciprocal. And we're evaluating that again from one to four. Simplify this, right? So two over one half is gonna actually give us what there for that first term? Four, right? Because dividing by a half, same thing as multiplying by two. We get four X to the one half. And then like we said, dividing by five halves, same thing as multiplying by two fifths. And we have X to the five halves. And now at that point, we're just gonna substitute in and then subtract. Start with your upper limit here. So we're gonna have four times four to the one half plus two fifths, four to the five halves minus four times one to the one half plus two fifths times one to the five halves. Okay. 
Now, honestly, at that point, right, you can put all that in the calculator um, and simplify it, or if you want to go term by term, you can do that also. We do that here. 4 to the 1 half is 2. 2 times 4 is 8. 4 to the 5 halves, that's square root um, of 4, which is 2 to the 5th, is 32. 32 times 2 fifths is going to give us 64 over 5. Over here now, 1 to the 1 half is 1, so 4 times 1 is 4. 2 fifths times, again, 1 is just going to give us plus 2 fifths. And so if we simplify all of that now, what should we get? Good, 82 over five. Or if you prefer the de decimal here, 16.4 is equivalent. So either one of those answers is fine. So always look for ways that you can simplify first, right? Because a lot of times you'll actually be able to simplify these fractions and then just take your antiderivative. If that's not the case, that's when we would go to a use substitution, okay? Any questions on that one now? All right, so we get part B. So this time we've got the integral from zero to pi over two, cosine x sine of sine of x dx. So what are we gonna have to do this time? This time we do have to do a u substitution. Good. So we're going to let it be the sine of x. That's our inside function there. So u equals sine of x. Let's think about what this is going to look like now when we do our substitution. So I know that second piece, the sine of sine of x, is just going to become sine of u. And so what do I still need to replace at that point? Yeah, the cosine x and the dx, right? So when I take my u prime over here, or my du dx, what's that going to give us? That is our cosine x, right? Because the derivative of sine is cosine. I need cosine x dx. So I'm going to move the dx to the other side. We just get du equals cosine x dx. So really, this one just becomes sine of u du. All right, now, what do we have to do at that point? Good, change your limits of equation because we've changed this to u now, right? So let's look at our upper and lower. So we look at the upper limit here, pi over 2. I'm going to substitute that into my u to get what u would be in this case. So that's going to be sine of pi over 2. So what's the sine at pi over 2? Good. That's at 90 degrees, right? So that's 1. And then if we look at the lower limit, we're looking at sine of zero. What's the sine of zero? That's going to be zero. Good. So now our limits are going to go from zero to one instead. All right. Now we can find our antiderivative. What's the antiderivative of sine? negative cosine, 
good. So we have negative cosine u evaluated from zero to one. Now we substitute in, we get negative cosine of one minus negative cosine of zero. Now, negative cosine of one, we can't simplify, right? That's an exact value. It would give us a decimal if we put it in the calculator, so leave that alone. What about the cosine of zero, though? That's going to be one, right? And so we have minus a negative. That becomes positive. This is actually a plus one now. So that would be our final answer, negative cosine one plus one. Leave that as is, right? Don't convert that to a decimal and round it. Okay, if you do, I'm probably still gonna give you credit because I know you at least did the steps correctly, um, but I would just leave it like that as an exact value. Okay. All right, so we're out of time for today. Um, we only got two more parts to this one um, that we'll definitely finish up tomorrow. I am also going to show you tomorrow um, how we can put these integrals into our calculator to check our answers, right? Because that's something I didn't do earlier on in the semester. Um, so I'll show you that tomorrow. Um, and again, if you have any specific examples that you really want to look at more um, similar types, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to kind of choose some random ones um, and we'll work through those tomorrow also. Okay. So that's the plan is to finish that up tomorrow. Um, let me know if you've got questions. Again, make sure you signed up for your exam time if you haven't done that already. Um, have a great afternoon, and I will see you all tomorrow.